This is a special presentation from the Brighton Central School District Board of Education. Good evening and welcome to the May 24th Brighton Board of Education uh, um, meeting. It is, today is an educational meeting and we're going to begin first. I'm going to um, turn it over to Dr. McGowan for a minute. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I would like to ask the people here to all consider for a moment uh, joining in a moment of reflection for the role that we play, we all play in division, in promoting hatefulness, in propagating conspiracies that divide us, and nurturing a lack of trust, and for the victims of hatefulness in Texas today, and most recently in Buffalo. I think we should reflect on doing more, being better, and being contributors to ending hate and divisiveness that has led to these terrible tragedies. Thank you. We're gonna to begin tonight with one of the highlights of our board meetings, and that is the Brighton Believer Awards, and I'm gonna turn that back over to Dr. McGowan again. Good evening and thank you for coming for this great recognition tonight. As you've heard several times before for several meetings, last school year the Brighton Believers Council selected 30 nominees to receive the Brighton Believers Award. We didn't forget about these members of our school community. We wanted to make sure they were recognized for demonstrating the Brighton Believers character traits of integrity, respect, responsibility, kindness, and self-control. The award winners are parents, students, teachers, staff members, coaches, and community members. I would ask that when the award winner is called, they come up and join me next to the podium along with the person who nominated them if they are here this evening. First up is Mark Henretta, nominated by Principal Matt Tappan. Mark Henretta, social worker, Council Rock Primary School, as I said, nominated by Principal Matt Tappan, who wrote, Mr. Henretta goes above and beyond every day. The relationships and rapport he builds with kids and families allow him to fully support the whole family. He tirelessly advocates for students and their needs as he works to teach, help students understand and grow, and build independence in children. Over the last year, he has gone above and beyond meeting with students over Zoom, finding ways to connect, changing his background to a variety of places around the country, and making kids guess where he was. Mark is a lifeline for many kids, families, and staff members. He gives of himself at all times. He embodies all of the Brighton Believes traits. Congratulations, Mark. Robin Ackerman, Mr. Tappan, come on back up. Robin Ackerman, please. Robin Ackerman, a second grade teacher at Council Rock Primary School, was nominated by Principal Matt Tappan. He wrote, Robin is a most amazing teacher and human being. Her kindness emanates from everything she does. The students in her classroom are quickly brought into the community of connectedness that she creates. As a remote teacher, she continued to build a positive, kind, nurturing, and supportive culture, even through Zoom. In the building, Mrs. Ackerman's positive energy can be felt at every meeting and through the hallways. Mrs. Ackerman is a true treasure and embodies each of the Brighton Believes characteristics each and every day of her life. Congratulations, Robin. Maria Kitsados, nominated by Megan Michelle Chi. <laughs> 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 
Maria Katsetos, a sixth grade social studies teacher, 12 Corners Middle School. Mangan wrote about her, Mrs. Katsetos built a relationship with my son through the additional time she spent with him, and that relationship turned into a motivation for my son to want to do well in her class. My son once told me, one day I want to be a social studies teacher like Ms. Katsetos. When being asked why, he said, I want to show pictures of Taiwan like Ms. Katsetos shares her photos taken at the Parthenon, Greece. I think a, a teacher with a beautiful heart and teaching passion should be acknowledged, and I believe the Brighton Believers Award would be a good one for recognizing the great work Ms. Katsetos does. We agree. Congratulations. Oh. Dr. Scott Stein, nominated by Jim Herman. <laughs> Dr. Scott Stein, nominated by Jim Herman, who wrote the 14-year-old Riverflow soccer club team. Scott coaches is a blend of races and backgrounds. And Scott's patience, kindness, and quiet strength brings this diverse group of teams together to form a cohesive unit. With COVID closing school and canceling the season, along with the unrest related to the presidential election and the murder of George Floyd, the world seemed to be turned upside down in 2020. This is where Scott's steady leadership and warm, caring personality proves so, so vital to his players and their families. Something as seemingly mundane as youth soccer provided them with a foundation they could stand on, and a sense of stability in a wildly unstable world. While so much of our country is divided, Scott's team is proof positive that diversity does make us stronger. Thank you, Dr. Scott Stein. Katie Falter, uh, nominated by student Ashton Ellis. Ashton, if you're here, please come on up. And Mrs. Edmonds. <laughs> Katie Falter, sixth grade social studies teacher at 12 Corners Middle School. As I said, nominated by Ashton Ellis. He wrote, Mrs. Falter represents the qualities that Brighton believes in. She is kind, engaging, understanding, respectful, and always goes above and beyond what's required. Mrs. Falter cares for each and every one of her students and also makes you feel valued. She spreads joy, hope, and excitement in the classroom and beyond. It's relaxing to be in her presence, knowing that she's not just a teacher, but a friend. I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to meet Mrs. Falter and to be her student. Thank you so much, Ashton, for that, and thank you, Katie. did say it should go in the refrigerator, and Mr. Falter should have to acknowledge it when he walks by. <laughs> <laughs> Ashley Ellis, nominated by Lonnie Mazurowski, teacher at French Road, uh, Steve and Tracy Lean. There's a whole list here, by the way. A well-nominated person, so come on up. And parent Jennifer Castle. justice if I read from all three perspectives. But I don't want any other award winners to feel like you got short shrift on this. The reality is there were three nominations, so there's different perspectives that I would like to share, and it's wonderful to think about all three of these. Lonnie Mazurowski wrote, there is no bigger fan of Brighton Believes than Miss Ashley Ellis. She lives and breathes it. This marks her third year in our district, but it's hard to remember Frez without her. Miss Ellis marches to the beat of her own drum. Her first conversations with students often center around a disabled cat 
named Lil Bub or the legendary <laughs> monster Godzilla. She deftly threads social emotional learning into both. Miss Ellis works to create shared language with her students that makes them feel respected, listened to, and honored. She meets kids where they are and helps them grow as members of a community. Her love for her students, Fres and Brighton Schools, is evident in every single thing that she does. Miss Ellis was also nominated, as we mentioned, by parents Tracy and Steve Lane. They wrote, Ms. Ellis made an immediate and lasting impact on the life of not only our Fred student, but our entire family. One of our children needed additional support and got that from Ms. Ellis. When moving to Brighton, Ashley and the Fred's team reassured us that things would be different here. Ashley was able to see past the negative behaviors that may have existed and see a kid who has so much to offer, needed caring adults to help him learn how to express himself appropriately, and she gave him that. He's learning how to manage those and to be supported thanks to Ashley's work. We feel so blessed to have had Ashley in our lives the past two years. Miss Ellis was also nominated by parent Jennifer Castle who wrote, Miss Ellis has been a vital contributor for my daughter at Fres. Without her continuous positivity and creativity, I'm not sure how well my third grader would have done. I know Ashley has the best in mind when it comes to her. Ashley deserves more than just an award and I hope she knows this. For all of this and all of this work and this right here is the award and the gift and congratulations to you. So Mrs. Gilbert, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll give them the polite, uh, we'd love for you to stay, but <laughs> uh, unless you have a burning desire to listen to the rest of the board's important but not as interesting work on a beautiful <laughs> spring evening, now would be the time. But two things that I want to say. You are the people doing what I mentioned at the beginning in terms of spreading love, spreading support for each other, and being examples of thoughtfulness, of caring, of connectedness in a world that is struggling with that. So I want to thank you for that and certainly wish you a good night, but also acknowledge the fact that Dr. Scott Stein is here also with Dr. Mort Stein, mm -hmm. uh, a longtime board member and teacher in the district, and he said to me beforehand, Scott, that everything that was mentioned about you was because of him, so I thought that I should <laughs> bring this up, but also want to acknowledge Dr. Stein, who did so much to help us here and build the tradition of excellence here over many, many years. <laughs> did it as a board member, as an educator, but clearly, most importantly, as we acknowledge, as a dad. And so thank you for that, too. So again, thank you. So feel free. Now would be the right time. For, for anybody. <laughs> to move on to public participation. But before I, we do that, I just wanted to say that's our last um, presentation of Brighton Believers Awards for the year. But it has just been such a joy to see each presentation, each award winner, and, and the folks who have nominated them. So if anybody's listening, if there's someone special 
who's touched your lives in the district or in the community, please go to the website and you can download an application form because we're going to hope, hopefully continue to do this at our board meetings next year too. And now we're going to move on to public participation, which is an opportunity for the Board of Education and district leadership to receive feedback from the community. We allow three minutes per speaker in order to give everyone a chance to speak while also letting the board conduct and complete our business for the night. Um, I will note that whether directly or indirectly, our students are watching all the time. We consistently state that personal attacks or denigration will not be allowed towards anyone. You can provide your feedback or state your disagreement with policies or practices without attacking a person's character. I do have um, the name of Melanie Bernhardt who wants to speak. If there's anybody else who wants to speak, Dan Goldman is over there in the corner and you can fill out a card with your name on it. So Melanie, if you would like to go to the mic now, you can. Hello, I'm back. Um, so today, I'm not only addressing the board, but I'm really addressing also the members of the community um, that will be viewing this. Um, I first want to say it took a lot of courage for me to stand up here in multiple board meetings and speak up about issues that are impacting our children. Um, I know I get a lot of eye rolls every time I come up, and I expect a few negative comments from community because I know my views don't align with everybody in the community, um, which can be incredibly stressful but I've always been respectful and polite, but unfortunately I'm learning that this community is not, isn't always the same toward everybody else. Um, if anyone knows me, they can come out, they can count on a few things. One, I love this country and, and um, believe in freedom. Two, I love my kids more than anything and I just want them to grow up with the same freedoms that we did when we were in school. Um, finally, if I see there's something wrong or something just doesn't sit right in my gut, I don't sit behind my keyboard and complain. Um, I, I get involved, I stand up, I speak out. I truly believe that being part of the school board would have allowed me to get involved to make a difference, which is why I had decided to run. I knew it would be difficult, but I was not prepared for was the behavior from this community that I have been a part of for 25 years. Um, for all the platitudes about equity, inclusiveness, and social justice, it was shocking to see the intolerance and the viciousness of people that live here. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go to the Brighton Community Facebook page and see how much I was attacked. Um, grown adults were reduced to childish behavior that you would see in a group of middle school bullies. I welcome a debate about any subject and I support that everyone should have a right to their opinions, but what I experienced was nothing short of character assassination. It got so bad that my kids were coming up with excuses not to go to school, and I was just a mom running for school board. Along with a local publication, members of this community went to work attacking me personally instead of challenging me on my views. A lot of trouble was taken, down, taken to track down pictures or information of, on me that we were used to falsely slander my reputation. I have never hidden my views about the policies on COVID or my support for parental rights. I have stood here wearing Moms for Liberty shirt many times and spoke on these very issues. And just a quick blurb on the Moms for Liberty, it's just a nonprofit organization of supporting parents, just like the New York State uh, Council of Superintendents support superintendents. Um, the Council of Superintendents is not a right-winged extremist organization and neither is Moms for Liberty. The organization has 90,000 members and was founded by two moms in January of 2021 that sat on a school board and saw the need for parent representation and a resource to support them. But this is just one of many clubs and organizations that I belong to, but for some reason, that one organization was highlighted conveniently the day before the election. I just M thought- Melania, I, I just want to point out that uh, a board member raised that you've reached the three minutes, so. Oh, okay. So just to remind you again, I do represent a group of people, of like-minded parents, t teachers, and taxpayers that do share my views, and I hope that you as the board would reach out to me and sit down and want to understand what our concerns are instead of just slandering us on Facebook. Thank you. So, right, Melania, if I... I would certainly uh, 
wouldn't speak for any board members. I do want to point out to you, though, that in our review of our Facebook page, the dialogue that you're discussing did not happen on our Facebook page, not even in the comment section. It was unrelated to any publication, anything related to anything the district was doing, played no role in any of that. We obviously don't support the slandering of anybody or uh, participate in that, nor did any board member or staff member administratively. I, I did not notice either in any of those comments, anything that I saw where uh, the district had any involvement or anybody at this table had any involvement whatsoever. Yeah, and I knew that they didn't. I would okay. say be aware of what's in your community sure. and what a lot of us are facing, and I wanted the board to be aware so that you understand how parents are being treated that might have a different view. Because I know you constantly stress that, and there is still another group that is completely ignored. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else? If not, we're going to move on. And can I ask for a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Karen? Second. Sue, second the agenda. All in favor? Aye. Next, we're gonna have an approval of the minutes from May 10th, our business meeting, and from May 17th, the annual meeting and election. Um, could I have a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Andrea? Second. Esther, are there any questions, any discussion, any, any corrections? Okay, then, um, all in favor? Aye. Okay, we're ready. And now we're going to move on to our math and science program evaluation updates. Dr. Ryu, uh, Dr. Kandekar, and Andrea Doyle. <laughs> all right, hello again, everyone. Um, I'm here today with two of our instructional leaders, um, both who work at the 612 level. Andrea Doyle, who's our um, math intervention support teacher who has been working as an instructional specialist this school year. Um, and Alpha Kandar, who is working as our 612 science leader. So we have two of our awesome instructional leaders, and I just have to say before we start, because they're gonna jump in and participate in this conversation as well, that we definitely wouldn't have made the progress and the growth we continue to do in curriculum without the support of all of our instructional leaders, especially the two that are here tonight. So I thank you both for being here and presenting on your programs. I'll give a quick update on Program Eval and what it is so everybody has a little bit of background. I know that some people were part of our program evaluations this year for math and science and others in years past. And then Andrea and Alpha will give us some updates in math and science. So why do we do program, program evaluation? Just to um, continue to review the information that we have about each one of our programs from each content area across the board. We operate on a five-year review where we're just looking at everything that's changed and shift and our goals that we've set in the past and making determinations about how we can continue to move forward, what's working well that we should continue with, what we might wanna reassess as we're looking at different curriculum or as we're looking at different instructional practices that would support um, shifts in um, whatever the content area is. And I'll talk a little bit about why we do that, but really our focus is on two pieces. One is on our students and one is on our organization as a whole. And when we're thinking about the work of our students, we're looking at how are our students achieving and how are they learning. So what does that look like? It might look like looking at student data, it might be talking to students, it might be looking at the curriculum that we've put in place for particular content areas. And then also looking at the focus of our organization as a whole. So how do we set students up to move through the programs, to have access to the courses, to um, have different experiences. And um, those are two of the key pieces that we look at when we're doing a program evaluation. In general, some questions that we think about in program evaluation and ones that we looked at across both math and science are about how well our students are achieving and how we're supporting that achievement looking for overarching themes for our study or specific <coughs> indicators. What, what are we seeing in the classroom? What would we want to see more of in the classroom? And also, is our curriculum getting at the standards um, that we want to? And are, is our curriculum getting at um, different ways for students to experience learning throughout the year and throughout you know, the whole K-12 experience? We think about how students are learning, if they're having different learning experiences. We're looking at assessment practices. We're looking at the whole gamut to whatever um, kinds of questions might come up. This is our general plan and process. We look at previous program evaluations and we kind of assess our current state to see where we are and where we wanna go. 
Um, the program evaluation committee works on developing goals for the focus of the work and then spend some time over the course of the school year. This started in the summer last year and then over the course of the school year, we met and talked about possible data sources, surveys, focus groups, data review, collected data, which um, our instructional leaders will speak to in a little bit, analyze that data and then making recommendations, recommendations for moving forward for the next um, five years. This is just a quick glance at some different <coughs> types of data we'll look at. You'll hear about a little bit of what we looked at in terms of surveying our students and staff members and some data that we analyzed, but really considering all the different aspects of data, including demographic data, who's enrolled in what class, um, what, you know, when students take particular courses and when they enter the program for that class, looking at perception data, how people feel about their learning, how students feel when they feel successful, um, how um, teachers' perception of instruction that's happening in curriculum. We look at student learning, the assessment data that we might have on, on our students, and then just the processes. So when we're considering a process, we're thinking about you know when is a student able to start acceleration, or when can a student have an opportunity to take a different class, for example. And I'm going to pass it over to Andrea now to jump into our math problem about. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks, Dr. Rio. So we've actually had several uh, program evaluations in math, and so we actually took our time to reflect and read back uh, what has already happened and what reports we already have to look at if we actually did accomplish the recommendations put forth the last time, and then what's currently on our mind uh, in the world of math education. So these were the five goals that we established when we did that. Um, you'll notice culturally responsive education is a part of that. That was not something we were talking about six years ago when we did our last program evaluation. And then we've also adopted everyday math at the K-5 level uh, since the last program evaluation. And then it was really important to consider are we meeting the needs of the current students who have been influenced by our advances in technology and the pandemic. So it's important to note that this program evaluation uh, focused more on surveys than past ones have. Our data was interrupted by COVID, so we had to rely a little bit more on surveys than we have in past evaluations. Um, in the survey, teachers were asked about training, if they needed training, uh, if the, it was meeting the current needs of students, how they felt about PD, when they wanted PD, what kind of PD, et cetera. Um, and also, you know, differentiated instruction and the status of our culture responsive practices. We were then able to sort demographically. Uh, we looked K-5, K-12, 6-12, also at, you know, special, what special ed teachers were saying versus ENL teachers versus academic support intervention specialists. Um, and then we also got to survey students. So we surveyed 5th, 8th, and 11th graders and they were asked about how they feel about math and being a mathematician and also how they feel in math class. Uh, I was fascinated though not surprised how many students measured success by their grades and that students felt valued when they participated in class. Uh, we also was a, were able to sort that data by gender, race, and whether they were accelerated or not. So I've actually been a part of the math leaders group uh, that meets, you know, quarterly or so throughout the last few years. And the five go six transition has been a common conversation at that table. Um, so that was definitely something that we needed to think about in this program evaluation. It was also exciting in my role this year to be able to see firsthand the everyday math pilot that we piloted at sixth grade, investigating what was happening there. Um, through the teacher planning meetings that I attend and also through being able to pop into the classrooms and observe the lesson that was actually happening. Um, and then also since my role has been academic intervention and addressing uh, how things are going, I realize that there are some differences in how AIS is determined and administered and I've worked very closely with the TCMS math department to establish some clear entrance and exit criteria for their AAS that we hope to put into place for the fall, which was kind of happening coincidentally with this. Um, an interesting observation that came from the survey was that 50% of math teachers say the program, math program does not differentiate, so that's something we definitely need to look further into. Um, and as always, when you ask teachers, they always ask for time. 
time to collaborate, time to work together, and the principals and Dr. Rio have been very supportive in uh, keeping some of the common planning time that 612 teachers already have, and also in creative ways that we can, we've already started brainstorming to have them work together. And then from the survey, we are off to a great start with our professional development on culturally responsive practices, but teachers definitely asked loud and clear for that to be math specific. So that's something we're... I'm gonna give you a minute, since these are the recommendations that the committee put forth, just to read those. So the math leaders actually met uh, last week and started brainstorming and have already established a day to address the first bullet uh, in the summer where K, we are hiring several K, new K-5 teachers and that they would be able to have some training directly on everyday math and be prepared entering into the school year. Um, Inquiry-based math programs that we currently have at the K-12 level require continual support and that was something that came through the program eval and that we need to be cyclic with our math uh, PD. Um, I look forward in my role to also supporting teachers in culturally responsive practices through the classroom talks so that the students who felt valued said they participated and you know, sharing practices that will help encourage that. <coughs> Uh, throughout my role this year, I have also started to support courses to identify problems or create lessons that will fill the gap from COVID or repeat the skill, extend the thinking to allow for access and equity to all learners and look forward to continuing that. And then uh, everyday math will be extended to sixth grade starting in the fall. Um, and part of our work, we actually visited a Fred's fifth grade classroom uh, so that we could see what they're experiencing now to help with the five go six transition. And of course, thank you to everyone who participated. Um, I do find program evaluation to truly be a fascinating experience because of the variety of people and the different <coughs> lenses and insights that everyone brings to the table uh, and the unique perspective. So thank you to those that took the time. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Alpha. Hello, I'm Alpa Kandar, and I'm serving currently um, as a high school teacher, but also in a part-time role as a science instructional leader, 612. Um, we had some similar goals as the math department did for our science program evaluation. Um, one of the things that was one of our goals was to capture what curriculum and concepts are taught at each grade level and to try to get a map of it. Um, another thing that we were interested in is um, there are new standards that have been put forth for science, the Next Generation Science Standards that in New York are known as NISLIS, which stands for New York State Science Learning, Learning Standards. <laughs> um, Thank you, New York State. Uh, we call it NISLIS all the time, forget what it stands for. But um, so this has been something that when my position was started, which was about seven or eight years ago, um, it was floated that new standards are coming, and then they waited, and New York State waited, and New York State waited. So it's still, despite the fact that it's been seven years, the first actual implementation of a new test is going, this year's sixth graders will in, be taking a new eighth grade test, um, so it's still two years out, um, and so that's the current timeline. So one of our things that we were looking for is how, how much are our K-12 teachers aware of this implementation process? Have we been doing a good job in communicating? And are they preparing for it? And also to do a gap analysis of where are we now and are we ready to be where we need to be um, in two years and three years and four years. Another thing that we're looking at is developing a culturally responsive method for <coughs> students to communicate the scientific method. Um, I think that there's a common view that maybe culturally responsive education doesn't have a role in science or in math. 
And I think that we are learning that there are definitely some students that feel like they belong in science and some students that don't. And that's a question that we're asking. And, our, and one of our goals is to make sure that every child who walks through our halls at Brighton is a student who feels that he or she can consider themselves a scientist. Um, and the last thing is, um, this is something we're still holding off for the future, is to look at data to look at who accelerates in science in Brighton, who ends up in AP courses, and do we have any unintentional barriers in the way? And so that's one of the questions that we are asking as well. So we also um, implemented a survey, and um, we asked teachers, um, as far as cross-cutting concepts and science practices, this is new language that we're using, so I think when you teach science, we think about content, and that you're gonna learn about an atom, or you're gonna learn about a cell. Um, but I think one of the things that is changing is we're learning that, learning how to analyze data, learning how to ask a good question, um, learning how to interpret patterns, that these skills are science too, and that they need to be explicitly taught. And so we surveyed teachers about which cross-cutting concepts and practices they are using, which ones they're interested in learning more about. Um, in terms of use of curriculum, we have uh, purchased curriculum K-5 and also purchased some curriculum 6-8. And so we're curious as to how that curriculum is now being implemented and what further support teachers need. So that was another thing that we asked teachers about. What are the needs for further professional development? Um, as Andrea mentioned, we're always interested in more time and more learning. Um, and I don't need to list all of them, but another thing we're looking at is the culturally responsive practices in science as well. Um, so in terms of our survey, one of the things we learned is that um, with the curriculum that we've purchased, it's still very challenging with all the demands on the teachers for them to get to everything that they're supposed to. So we need to make sure that there is time for us to prioritize units and prioritize content and make sure that the things that we are making time for are the most important things. Um, another thing we're looking for is K-12 vertical alignment. Are students growing in the skills that we want them to be growing in? Um, and finding more time, summertime, um, after school time, department meeting time, to continue to support these initiatives um, and looking at more professional development specifically around the culturally responsive practices with respect to science and identifying barriers that are in place. So this is a long list, but um, the recommendations that we're looking at now that we've completed the evaluation <coughs> is developing a vertical curriculum map that includes not only the content, but can we identify where students are constructing explanations, arguing with evidence, analyzing data, um, and looking how, at how that's growing and spiraling through K-5. Um, kindergarten right now doesn't have clearly defined science concepts, so that's one of the things we're trying to look at to make sure that there is some fidelity to some curriculum that's happening in our kindergarten classrooms. Um, and continuing to help teachers understand what the New York State science standards are in addition to the content, and that's something that we're continuing to work on. I think most of us who are in teaching learned a certain way, but the way that we're being asked to teach now is a little bit different than how we learned ourselves. And so there is definitely some PD and some um, mind shifts that are involved in that. Um, and we're gonna continue to review some student data as well to learn a little bit more about what opportunities we're offering our students and looking into possible roadblocks. So I think that's the last slide. Okay, and thank you to our committee members who helped us <coughs> along the way this year. Um, this is the, I think the third <coughs> program evaluation I've been able to be a part of. And <coughs> so thank you to the board for continuing to support the science instructional leader positions and in all in math, science, English, and social studies, we appreciate it. Okay, thank, thank you. you. All right, thank you, any questions? No, but thank you. It looks like you've got an enormous amount of work done this year. We did. You really did, very <laughs> exciting. You. I'll note too that over the years that I've been involved as both a parent and a board member, I've watched how this process is being refined yeah. and I think that, that that has great opportunity for us. Mm -hmm. so. And I, I can't resist, I have to add something as well. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm currently taking a biostatistics class <laughs> as, a, as an adult <laughs> and I wish I got a survey question about how do you feel in math class because I feel awful. And so, like, I wish someone would ask us. So it's amazing that, like, we're surveying our kids and saying, how do you feel? And everybody should be able to feel like a scientist. So it's, it's so important. So I, 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 I love being a part of this. I think it's awesome. So thank you. Thanks, Sue. <laughs> thank you. We're going to move on.
move on now to our principal reports. And Mr. Tappan, you want to go first? Oh, good. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just knew it. <laughs> oh, thank you. So this is our final uh, presentation of the year, which is hard to believe. It is yes, hard to believe. it is. Wow. It is. <clears throat> so an exciting event that we had uh, at Council Rock was uh, Jardine Nolan, a uh, visiting author, came to Council Rock, and it was it was so great on many uh, many points. But first, it was the first uh, assembly that we've had in the new space. We realized it was the first assembly that any of the kids at Council Rock have had because they haven't been able to uh, since we closed and weren't able to get back together. Um, she was amazing, inspirational, funny. Um, the kids laughed. She So without disparaging other authors, just because you're a great children's author doesn't necessarily mean you're a great children's yeah. presenter. You think the two go hand in hand. Um, she has the gift of both. She had the kids in the palm of her hand. Um, I compared her to a Pixar movie because the adults were also hysterical laughing. The kids didn't know what we were laughing at, but she had us on both levels of humor. Um, she shared stories. She shared where her inspiration comes from as a writer, connecting to our kids, and um, you know, sharing that she is just a regular person who loves to write. And a lot of kids got a some great connections with that. Um, she shared three presentations, one uh, for our kindergarten students, so it was definitely geared to our kindergartners, and then one to our first uh, mixed first and second grade, two, uh, two groups. Um, and she was just fantastic, a ball of energy. She was just great. Um, and there she is. A special thanks to the PTSA, who helped to fund that, um, and our amazing librarian, Adele Motskovichis, who um, planned the whole trip and Jardine gave her a lot of credit because <coughs> she picked up the phone and called and said, are you Jardine Nolan? Because I want you to come to our school. And um, she connected that by having an amazing and inspirational librarian was what brought her here. So um, then we had an extra added bonus, um, again, through the PTSA and through some grant money, um, a book that she co-authored with Tiffany Haddish uh, called Layla, the Last Black Unicorn. <coughs> Um, coincided, so she was here on Friday, the 5th or 6th, I believe, and the following Tuesday, the book was coming out. She shared some pictures and uh, a little bit about the story and kind of teased our kids, like, I hope one day you'll be able to get this book and, you know, see it. And the kids were like, yes, we hope so, too. They had no idea that we were throwing a birthday party for the book that day. The PTSA did amazing work. We got pre-published, I mean, we worked with the publisher to get them the day that it was released, which doesn't happen. Um, Liftbridge uh, Cafe, or Liftbridge Book uh, book Company uh, got us the books there, and uh, each class got a hand-wrapped gift um, with unicorn hats and uh, uh, party blowers, and each class unveiled and had a birthday party for Layla and then read. <coughs> Subsequently, <clears throat> as we do every year to kind of get the reminder about the budget and the school board vote, we voted on what was your favorite Jardine Nolan and like landslide, <laughs> normally we don't have that, was Layla. Um, and so they really connected with the book and it was, it was a really great treat. So again, thanks to everybody who helped to make that happen. And these are pictures of Robin Ackerman's room um, celebrating. Uh, we honored two of our great teachers. Uh, at the PTSA Life Membership Awards, uh, Jenny Robinson and Liz Files. It was a great night for Council Rock um, to celebrate the greatness of, of each of those ladies and our entire staff. So we also had field trips back, uh, another first. Um, they have not happened for several years. Our first graders uh, went to the fish hatchery, um, and this is a picture of Liz Files' class. Um, we did have one mishap of a child in with the fishes. Um, so that wasn't Liz Files' class. Um, it was a different class. I won't mention that teacher's name, but they did come in. But we had, of course, the most prepared parent. It wasn't their child who went in, but they had a full change of clothes for their child in case they went in. And it was given to the other uh, young lady who ended up in the water. So, uh, but a great day uh, connecting to their science curriculum. Uh, our second graders 
led by our uh, geologist who I've reported about before, Tyler Lucero, a former student of mine. Um, I had him in sixth grade English uh, in Rosh Henrietta. Uh, he is a geologist. He gave a tour of um, Menden Ponds and all of the geology and amazing geological features that are there that connect with directly with the science unit that they do along with work that they've been doing with Mrs. Yaman. Um, and this particular group went on a day, you can think about all those beautiful days that we've had. They went on the one day that had the crazy downpour. Um, I was so worried about them, they came back, they had more fun than any of the other classes. So um, they danced in downpours and had uh, a super great time. And then our kindergartners will be going to Highland Park to complete their uh, and go to the Highland Conservatory and um, complete their study of plants uh, in June. So that hasn't happened yet, no pictures of that. <clears throat> and then uh, second grade transition to Fren French Road has begun um, with Gusto. So um, we have a whole list of events that Mrs. Jeffries and I have collaborated with. We've brought in Ms. Evans um, and Ms. Flores who will be there in the fall to help with that. Um, but we had a PTSA meeting uh, with the parents we had classroom visits by Ms. Flores, Ms. Evans, and Mr. Green um, to introduce themselves to our second graders and kind of talk up some of these upcoming events. Uh, we also had the first second grade movie night, um, which was Luca, very, very well attended. It was like this great, wonderful new thing that they got to go and lay out a blanket and watch a movie in, in French Road. So um, hopefully just getting them comfortable. Uh, third grade orientation is next Thursday for families, for, uh, for those second graders becoming third graders. Next Thursday from 6.30 to 7.30, we will all be there. And then we have a trip planned from Council Rock to French Road on Wednesday, June 1st, where they will have an opportunity to ask questions, meet with a third grade classroom, play on the playground, because that's very important. Even though we do have great playgrounds, they're French Road playgrounds, and they're so excited about them. Um, and then receive a tour um, from staff uh, <coughs> there at, at French Road to, to just see the entire building. We've got a lot of upcoming events. So I mentioned that orientation. We do have an early release day this Friday. I always like to explain it. I'm not the best at explaining it, but we roll out of the, the um, parking lot on a normal day at 2.45. So parents at home who are wondering, when will my child get home? So take 2.45, and when your child normally gets home, if they get home at 3.15, it's about a 30-minute bus ride. We will roll out of the parking lot at 11.30 on Friday. Those children would arrive around noon, so give or take. Um, be out there about 10 minutes early. Um, and then we have no school on Monday as we celebrate Memorial Day. That field trip to French Road is on Monday the 1st. We have our fun day uh, on June 3rd, organized by our amazing PE teachers. If it rains, which it's not going to, uh, it would be uh, moved to Monday the 6th. Wednesday the 15th, we have our first ever second grade celebration concert. Our two music teachers are collaborating to have students singing and joining. We always did something, but this is actually a presentation that parents can be invited to. Again, we're hoping for weather to be cooperative and it will be in the back field and there will be ice cream that you can buy. And then Friday the 17th, our Council Rock family picnic, which is replacing the hot dog roast, um, but during your child's lunchtime. So a lot of fun events, a very busy time um, celebrating all that has been a pretty amazing year. So any questions? Just hard to believe that you're reporting on all the end of the year things already. I don't know where the year went. It it's is. unbelievable. I it bet is. you don't feel that way. <laughs> some days it feels like it's been a minute, and some days it's been... That's life. <laughs> yes. That's life. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Morin? Oh, she's up before I even said her name. You're welcome. Good evening, everybody. <coughs> Matt stole a lot of my thunder, so I'm glad I was selective on what I added in here. Um, something that really when I started putting this together is at you know first and <coughs> foremost on my mind these days is Mrs. Evans and how grateful truly excited um, eager and uh, I'm all the things that I am really and just so grateful to already be working with her in many ways um, she had an, uh, an event that she was able to join which was one of our most recent in school uh, band and chorus concerts where we're now able to have the whole student body going together, which is awesome in and of itself. Uh, but she was able to sneak out and come and join us for that. 
And so um, that was just really something that you could feel the energy in the room. We've been talking a lot about it. Um, there's a lot of conversation going on amongst classrooms these days, particularly as students start to mentally plan for the end of the year. That started maybe a couple weeks ago, but this was just a really positive event. And like I said, I'm already starting to tap into her lots of questions and heads up and just looking for ways to connect. And it's really just been a joy. So we, we love that. We've been really <coughs> thinking carefully and trying to reflect on the experiences that our students and families had as a result of COVID. And what we really found as a building is that it, it had been a while uh, for some of our families to be in the building with their child. And so this fall, we were dipping our toe in, kind of walking back slowly toward the things that we typically did with our curriculum nights. And this spring, we wanted to offer ice cream socials for all of our grade levels. And so this week, actually tomorrow night, we're gonna be wrapping <coughs> up all three of those, uh, making sure that our fifth graders also had uh, a time to be able to uh, enjoy with their children what their kids have been up to aside from uh, just the fifth grade celebration and that more casual end of the year wrap up. So this is a student in fourth grade who um, I've, I've known for a long time and has just really done some remarkable things this year. But some of the things that our students showed off, uh, the student was able to create an actual change maker. So that is Barack Obama that you see right there. And uh, they were able to use an app called ChatterPix to then um, speak as that change maker and give a little synopsis of some of the work that they've done and the accomplishments that they've made. So on the child's iPad that was there, you saw a photo of President Obama and that child's voice kind of emanating to, to speak what they had learned and what they now know about that character or that person, I should say. We also were able to participate in a really wonderful event that again, we've been away from for a while, the Ride for Missing Children. We actually partnered quite a bit with this organization um, this year, the Center for Missing and Exploited Children, as they provided some uh, instruction to our students around cyber safety and how to be a good digital citizen. We also did a parent information night where they actually came and did a nice presentation for parents just on what we really need to be thinking about and being knowledgeable um, about these days and things that questions we need to be asking our students at home. Um, and so we had uh, the ride last week and our students were able to come out and celebrate and just be part of the broader community. Even for a few minutes, it goes pretty quickly. Uh, as Matt mentioned, in connection with the budget vote um, and to just involve our students in the community once again in that, in that task of voting, our students voted on a Frez Spirit Day. And so our student council came together, they came up, gosh, maybe 30 ideas of what types of Spirit Day we could have. And we really focused on ways that we could make sure every single kid was included. We didn't need to go out and buy things. You know, what could we really think um, and be clever about? So we decided uh, to put out a few uh, options for students to vote on, and our student body decided that we would have a day last Friday where our students dressed like teachers and our teachers dressed like students. And so our, our kids had a blast with this, and you can see here, this is one of our fourth grade friends who chose to dress like Mr. Henry. Uh, and then we had students dressing up like uh, some of our Brighton Believes Award winners. There's Mrs. Ellis on the left. Mrs. Leckenby in a familiar face on the left there, who's also a fourth grader, Emma McGowan's in that photo. Um, and we have two other teachers here on the right that were complete with their coffees and name tags that I was able to snag of them at the entrance. Um, so it was just, it was really awesome. And if you, if you knew what the teacher in the middle, what she typically wore, what her style was, her class really nailed it perfectly. So it was just something fun and, and just uh, having a little fun together. Oh, well, that's okay. Wow. So that's what happens when I have a student participate in my presentation and support some of the work that's happening. So <laughs> far more advanced than I am, apparently. <laughs> um, so uh, we, we partnered with Dr. Ryu uh, as we recognized and celebrated some new uh, calendar events and some special holidays with our community this year. And so uh, we wanted to support teachers and classrooms and making sure that we had literature to support Eid, Ramadan, um, and then coming up <coughs> Juneteenth as well. So Dr. Ryu generously uh, supported us in getting several texts for our libraries, both at Council Rock and at French Road. But this is one of the books that one of our fourth grade classes read about Eid. And it just so happened 
uh, that a student in this class celebrates Eid, and she really took the lead in a lot of the ways that just brought the classroom community together, supported the teacher as the teacher owned. This is my own new learning also. This is what I've come to know now, but as we read through this book, you know, it's, please excuse any mispronunciations I'm learning, and if you could help me or guide me, I'd appreciate that. And so this student that helped participate in this presentation as well, Kenzie, uh, is a fourth grader, and uh, she wanted to share, <laughs> she's really <laughs> loving PowerPoint also. <laughs> Um, <laughs> when you go through the slideshow view, it doesn't actually um, walk you through these pieces. So let me just get to Kenzie's big ideas here. Oh, um, they're coming. So really what, what we focused on were um, the background behind the holiday itself, the back work that the teacher did um, in preparing prior to reading the book, and really as she's saying these things and sharing with the class about the preparation that went in and you know that this is something new for her too this student chose to create a pronunciation guide uh, for the teacher to just kind of walk through the different things that would be encountered in the story itself and so you can see it's even she even has it broken down on how you would pronounce each of the syllables they talked about this as a class uh, very openly before the book was shared and so this is her own synopsis of the book she summarized it for me as she provided this information. And part of the story talks about the significance of bangles um, with the culture and with um, the story itself, Eid and the moon bangles. And so as a result, uh, they had continued this conversation. This is, I'm telling you. Uh, they continued this conversation, and this is a teacher that constantly looks to build community within her classroom and strengthen that. And so uh, some students came in with bangles, one or two here or there. And the teacher brought them in and just offered them up and said, you know, if you want to connect with the story further, I have some bangles if you'd want to put them mm -hmm. on. Or this is every hand from that class. Um, and so hearing that student share that this was a new entry point for them to be able to share their culture in a way that was more than just standing up and presenting and kind of being that sole person uh, to shoulder the responsibility of sharing, really guiding and learning alongside her, her peers was really um, inspirational for her. And I think. Um, really developed her leadership within the classroom too. So we have lots of events coming up at French Road. As I mentioned, tomorrow we have our fifth grade ice cream social. We have our third grade orientation at Fres later this week, which I'll be partnering with Mr. Tappan on, and we're hopeful that Mrs. Evans will also be there at that event as well. So we're looking forward to bringing those new families in. <coughs> as Matt mentioned, we will also be dismissing students early at French Road on Friday. Parent pickup will begin at noon and our bus dismissal right around 12.30. Uh, we also will have, as Matt mentioned, our second grade visits to Fres, And also on the other side of the transition, our fifth grade crossover activity night, which our PTSA is really looking to add uh, some new creative ideas to make that night really fun and exciting for students. Uh, we also will have our fourth grade band concert on June 8th. Our field day, which will be very exciting. We're looking forward to it. It will be on June 14th. And then uh, again, our observation of Juneteenth on the 20th and the last day ending the year on the 23rd. So I also recognize this is my last board report uh, of the year, but also, you know, just in terms of making the transition back to Council Rock. And I just wanted to share, you know, this has been a really special experience, but one that's given me a really different perspective on the team I was already a part of, uh, and just reflecting more broadly on the community that we serve and the interactions with you all each month. So thank you so much, and I'm very grateful. Oh, so thanks. Thank you, Miranda. Wait, wait. Don't, don't go away. Don't go away too fast. Um, okay. Well, because then if you go away, you're not on camera, which you should be. So, uh, no, I, I just want to say to you, Marin, on, on behalf of everybody, you've done just such a wonderful job at French Road throughout the year, and we're so excited for you to come in and fill in in a space that we really needed somebody, and you've gone just above and beyond to make it a great experience for kids and the staff and to smooth that transition. And to watch you, you know, one, come to the conclusion that you wanted to work at Council Rock and be in that space and do that work, and cherish the opportunity to be a French Road and then work with Lashara in this transition has been really remarkable and it says a great deal about your character and who you are and who you are as a leader. So we're excited that you will continue to lead us and work with us in the capacity that you have always been so outstanding 
And it's been a pleasure to watch you grow and learn in this role too and think about how you can keep contributing to kids. And then to watch the Council Rock kids that you had at French Road that you previously had at Council Rock mm -hmm. be so excited to work with you in this time. It's been super cool too. So thank, thank you very so much. Thank you. So Mrs. Edmonds is gonna come up and Dan is pulling up a couple of slides because Mrs. Edmonds was very jealous that hers did not have that curtain effect and the variety of transitions that were possible. <laughs> Apparently there are more fantastic slides to come. Clearly know how unflappable now it is. <laughs> Completely unflappable. And I was encouraged to speak slowly as I said that there are some slides that are coming up. So. <coughs> Those lightning quick fingers of Dan Goldman. Not, not only a concert pianist, but an excellent communications coordinator. I do also want to note, Julie, that had Larry been here, I would have gone first. I'm just trying to know. I recognize that. I'm from, sorry. I'm feeling a little. I had a good a, run. I had a really yeah. good run going. Do you want to make another presentation before the end of the year? I can arrange it. Uh, uh, <laughs> you sure? Touche. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are at almost at June, which is unbelievable. I do feel like it's been a year, but it doesn't feel like a year. This has gone so quickly. So I can't believe we're presenting at the end of May already. And it, what's really super exciting is I feel like for the first time in May, a lot of things, a lot of traditions at TCMS have, have finally come back. So it's really nice uh, to be able to present on some of the things that our students were engaged in in May, starting with uh, the jazz band performing at the Lilac Festival. I think it was May 12th, we had our jazz band out there and we had about 15 eighth graders and over 27th graders participate on a beautiful day. It was amazing and their sound is always amazing and it's such a treat for them and they, they beam with pride and they have their TCMS jazz band t-shirts on and they just feel so good and such a part of it and the smiles on the teacher's faces are still there. Like they're just so proud of the students and what a wonderful day and opportunity. So I'm glad we continue to be able to do that year after year. I'm also glad to say that TCMS is finally and legitimately on the therapy dog train. We have two new additions this spring to our therapy, therapy dog population. We have Millie Perillo and we have Murphy Kamen. Um, both have joined us and as you can tell, the students love them. They've been coming in one dog probably about once a week and getting a, a, a the students are really good. I think the other teachers are learning to acclimate more than, than the students are. I think the students are, are used to having the dogs around and I think um, both uh, Ms. Perillo and Ms. Kamen push into other classes in a supporting role. So I think the other classroom teachers are trying to figure out like, what does this look like when a person and a dog comes into my room? And, and um, But it's been really, really great. So it's been a slow transition. We're looking um, forward to the fall when they'll be with us more regularly. They are the most adorable dogs on the face of the earth. Sorry, everyone. They're really <laughs> We also brought back our talent show, which has been away for a few years, and we had quite a few acts. You can see we had uh, some orchestral acts. We had uh, plenty of dancing, singing, piano playing, and just the excitement, not only of the students on stage, but all of their friends and family members who came to cheer them on. It was just such an amazing experience. We're so glad to have it back. It's super fun to see uh, the adults that, um, that do the judging and MC it, and the kids just have a good time being outside of the classroom with their adults, um, and it, it, we're really glad we were able to bring that back, and we really do have some amazingly talented students at TCMS. 
We also had some fun time in classes and sixth grade classes as students were working with Mrs. Lambert on some persuasive work and some research study. Students were studying uh, Greek gods and they each had an opportunity obviously to dress up as their Greek god and they gave a speech as their Greek god and they also created these awesome business cards uh, where they had to uh, persuasively sell their, their attributes. They had um, the most uh, safe snack distribution. You can see the nice thing of sanitizer right there, but there was also Mrs. Parks with all of her, her uh, toothpicks handing things out and keeping the kids separated. And it was just really great. They, there was a lot of laughter in the classroom, so the sixth graders really enjoyed this. And you could see our student on the right really went all out. Um, I put, I was jokingly put that vest of armor on. It weighed more than I did. Um, so it was interesting watching him try and get that into the classroom. But exciting to see kids participating and, and having fun and lots of laughter through the learning. We have some clubs to highlight. Our environmental club, I think I spoke about this before. This was a new <coughs> club that started in uh, January and what they ran for about 20 days in May was an eco challenge. So they put out challenges to the entire school community and then anybody in the school that wanted to could log their, their completion of those activities and then they gathered points over the 20 days. So the students were, were accumulating all the points, um, everybody was tallying them, and then the three winners are able to adopt an endangered animal. So they can adopt um, a panda, a chimpanzee, or an orangutan. <laughs> And all of the money comes from the Eco Club uh, and, and Mars Dixon uh, put in for a Hillshire grant. They secured $2,000 in this grant. Mm -hmm. So um, there's going to be quite a substantial donation. And uh, it's really fun to see the kids get so excited. The, the uh, environmental club sat out in the atrium every morning trying to get everybody excited about it and get kids engaged in it. And they really did a great, a, a phenomenal job, truly student-led and developed. And Mrs. Falter helped guide them. But it was really cool to see, because many of them are sixth graders, to see what they were able to put together and the enthusiasm that they have for it. So I'm excited to see what, what comes next year. And then we had our Science Bowl team. Um, they were national semifinalists. And unfortunately, again, because of COVID, they weren't actually able to go to DC to compete but they did compete virtually, and we'll lose a few to the high school, um, but we have a great team, and we did some recruiting last week with some great activities and lunch, so I, I'm, I'm sure that some of those holes that we're losing over to, to BHS will be filled with some really strong students, so we're excited to maybe make the finals next year. And then our last big thing is our world language trips returned this year after a two-year hiatus. On the left, we have our students in Quebec. In the middle is Central Park in New York City. And on the right is at the Von Trapp Family Lodge in Vermont with the German students. I was uh, fortunate enough to have gone on the Vermont trip. I have previously been on the New York City and Quebec trips. This is my first time to Vermont. Um, I have to tell you that it was the greatest experience. I, I still am like beaming with pride over our students because Everywhere we went, people stopped us to tell us how wonderful our students were. And I, you know, I'm not like, I wish, I'm not making it up. It was just amazing that every single place that we went, in the, in the lodge, while we were eating, we, there were plenty of people who were there just on their own vacations. They were coming and interacting with our students and I was just sitting back and watching them and our students were amazing with them. You know, was, listen, middle schoolers can be like awkward and funny and weird and you never know what you're gonna get when a stranger comes up to them and starts to talk to them. And they were just, they made eye contact with everybody. They were respectful. They carried on like 10 minute dialogues with, with people and they just, they made me so, so proud. And I know the other, um, I spoke to Ms. Newcomer and I spoke to Ms. Lopez, and they just said, you know, the students really rose to the occasion and, and showed what TCMS students really have to offer the world. So I, I'm, I'm so glad I had that opportunity to go and just be with them and watch. You know, obviously I had the great time to, of interacting with them, but sometimes it was really nice to just sit back and watch them be, and uh, it, it was fantastic. So the trips are super well organized. They are well-oiled machines, and I'm glad that other people organize them and I don't, but we did a great job. 
And lastly, like everybody else, just big time of year. So we're finishing up state testing with our science testing that's going on. We have performance testing and then actual you know, written testing going on in the next few days. We have some concerts going on. As Marin said, we have our 506 crossover activity night. We're actually really excited about this. Our TCMS Strong are organizing it. They're taking the lead. And what they've created for the first half an hour of the night is a scavenger hunt throughout the building. And all of the sixth grade teachers are leaving little bits of information around the building that students have to gather. We've invited their parents to come and walk through the building with them and do the scavenger hunt with them for those 30 minutes. Now, obviously, we're going to have orientation again in um, August, but just to hopefully like allay some fears as opposed to just hanging out in the atrium and the gym, they'll actually get a sense of the building a little bit um, in a more relaxed atmosphere. So we're excited to do that and to, and to meet many of the fifth graders. And um, our bonfire is on the 18th, so we're really excited about that. We were working with some of our teachers to set up some of the games that are going to take place. We have um, on the 16th, Mr. Green and I are heading over to French Road to go into all of the fifth grade classes to meet with all the students and, and do a little meet and greet, answer their deepest, darkest questions that they have for us. And, um, and then lastly, on the 23rd, I put a big asterisk next to that. It's normally our Sea Breeze and Darien Lake experience. Darien Lake is not open, so we cannot take our eighth graders to Darien Lake. And, um, we're having some, some issues with busing in terms of getting kids to Seabreeze. Seabreeze doesn't open until 11, and our buses have to be back here with students by 1.30. So it makes a trip to Seabreeze and the cost and everything that goes with it something that is kind of up in the air. So we're trying to be creative and think of lots of different other opportunities in order to, to allow students to have that final day activity. So um, right now we're in the planning stages and we're looking at potentially a couple of different things throughout the day that students can experience where they can be together, have fun, a little bit on campus, a little bit off campus. Um, so put an asterisk next to that and to be continued, but we're definitely going to create something for the students so they have that special end of year day. Right. Thank you, Daniel. Questions? Does anybody have any questions or comments? <laughs> and if you change your mind about that last meeting, let me know. I'll email you. Dr. Hall. Yes. Hello. Good evening. Right. I think I'm going to have to up my game on the slides and hire Morin's uh, student to help me out. But we'll see how we go tonight. Um, so just a celebration of a lot of things that are happening at the end of the year. You're going to hear some similar things, too. But our Best Buddies uh, Club, which is a club that works with students with um, different abilities. Uh, we had two students who participated in the Friendship Walk as a fundraiser, um, Sean and Brandon from the high school, and just had a fun time. It was a cool day, but they had a lot of sunshine and really enjoyed it, and they were just excited to tell me all about it when they got back. Um, two students, Lily Coyne and Sebastian Zebrick, uh, I presented on this before, and they will be recognized at our award ceremony on June 3rd, or June, no, June 2nd. Um, but they took an exam and basically scored high enough on this German um, uh, written exam that they have won an all-expense-paid trip to Germany for two weeks. All expenses paid, both flying to Germany as part of this uh, organization. But incredible, um, you know, they've worked really hard, and I'm sure they were in the Von Trapp Family Lodge way back in the middle school days, but uh, did amazing and just want to celebrate them. <coughs> Clean Sweep was back after two year hiatus. Um, we had our, a record number uh, 48 <coughs> students uh, help out um, from teams to clubs uh, to just students, random students who came and, and faculty advisors and coaches. Uh, started at the high school on Clean Sweep Day and cleaned up the entire school grounds. Senior nights continue. Um, these are just a few of them from uh, girls uh, and boys lacrosse, uh, softball and baseball, and had previous ones I think I shared even in the last uh, meeting, but they're wrapping up and now everybody's heading into sectionals, believe it or not, and finishing up their regular seasons. I want to give a shout out to all of our counselors, if they're listening at home, for putting together our Senior Decision Day in our new makerspace and 
It was basically an entire day where counselors were on hand, we had food, we had um, cards for them to make of saying where they're going either <laughs> off to work if they're taking a gap year, going into the military, which we have several this year, um, heading into the trades or heading off to a two or four year college. And so they were in this uh, room all day celebrating, making their signs, hanging them up, taking pictures, and just it was a great day all around. Senior ball. Uh, we had, uh, we're back, we were at CCR this past Saturday, uh, 315 students at one point in time. That's higher than our record of 280. Um, it was quite uh, the student body, and we were out on the patio until about 845 when you maybe recall the thunder and lightning and it wouldn't let up. Rain, deluge, everybody had to come inside. But had a great time anyway. Uh, great job with the, the advisors, uh, Ms. Rivera and Ms. Crowley and Jenny Vigiani who helped uh, do the decorations there, Teresa Mosier, and just all the chaperones. We had plenty of chaperones there to help out and just a really nice time. The kids uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. A couple more pictures of the other rooms. Summer weather, if you come out, I'm wishing, I was hoping that Friday for Spring Fest would look kind of like the pictures on the right and the left, but it doesn't quite look like it. We might have an indoor Spring Fest this year. Um, but with the nice weather, um, kids playing spike ball. This is a class on the left reading um, The Great Gatsby in 11th grade and sitting and then having discussions right on the front, uh, front of the high school, which I absolutely love. And that's during flex on the right. Um, Kids on the turf, kids under the tent, kids playing games. I mean, just a nice, like, middle of the day break time if you're not with your um, uh, teachers. Our nurses, we celebrated uh, um, Nurses Day in early May. Um, Janet, Amanda, Andrea, and Lakia, who've been amazing. We've got them all big, huge spring plants. And uh, just talk about nurses and the, the unsung heroes of the last two years. They have gone through so much, plus all the other things that they normally have to do, and then tracking COVID and dealing with all the phone calls and emails, and just it's never ending. So thank you to all of them. Our spring art show, which was K-12, opened up um, May 11th, and that'll run right through the end of this week. Had an opening reception on the 11th. Um, some incredible artwork all around from every building, and now it used to be the first grade to 12th uh, grade and now we've added kindergarten which is amazing and I'm just highlighting this one piece done by Ava Voss I, I mean I'm not a, I'm not an artist I don't do ceramics but I know this took a ton of time mm -hmm. and that particular piece probably took her four months in terms of the painting and everything that she did on it and she's going to donate it to our office to display in the main office when she leaves so quite incredible and I'm just really appreciative of that so upcoming things, we have a PTSA meeting with the principal tomorrow. We're going to talk about some new cell phone policies that we're rolling out for the high school next year that we've been talking about. Basically just in the classroom. It's nothing earth-shattering that we don't already kind of have in place, but we're going to be much more um, uh, vocal about it and just make sure that everybody's understanding why we're doing this in the classroom in particular. And that it's pretty much there's no cell phone zones as we go into next year. Q&A about the whole year and things like uh, that we've been doing. And Mike Leaner was going to talk about our light speed uh, system to monitor um, internet usage, usage and website visits from our students, but uh, that may be on, put on hold till next fall, so we'll see. Um, Spring Fest is back with a completely new format. We have classes in the morning for 20 minutes. Uh, the student council preferred to have classes and have their classes meet rather than having a speaker or getting together to do uh, speeches. So that's all been revamped to do speeches electronically and vote electronically and not pull people in and out moving around. So that's what's going to be for Spring Fest. Our award ceremony, also a new format. We're, we're sticking with the evening, 6.30 for the juniors, 7.15 for the seniors in our brand new auditorium though this year. Um, <laughs> June 1st, U.S. History Regents, canceled. So we will not have a U.S. History Regents. Let all the students know about that today. Word ceremony, the prom is coming up. That's going to be on campus on um, June 11th. We have a meeting Thursday with all of our juniors to talk about that. Last day of classes, no flex period. There will be no flex on that. Last day of classes, kids will have to eat in class, which they can now, or on a free period. 
and then we'll be counting down with the seniors with ice cream out on the, just after the turf when, once we count down. Uh, Regents exams start on the 15th through the 23rd and graduation on the 21st. And I did not mention here, and I don't think any of my colleagues did either, June 17th, another Making History Day, we'll be traveling to Council Rock, then French Road, then to the middle school with our seniors in their cap and gowns. And so we're adding the middle school this year to run around and we managed to finagle some buses um, even in this time uh, to get us over there and back so they can do the end of the day run. Questions? Busy time. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Tom. Great job, Tom. Right. Thank Great you job, all of you. It's awesome. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, next on our agenda tonight is the approval of the 2022-2023 Board of Education meetings. Um, we had discussed those dates previously. Can I have a motion to approve those? So moved. Andrea? Second. Sec Second was Christina. Christina. Any questions or comments? I, I would just comment that Andrea seemed very enthusiastic about setting the dates for meetings <laughs> for next year. Very. Thanks, she jumped Andrea. right into that. I I want you to all be make there. Make that motion. <laughs> <laughs> we know you'll be I'll watch. I'll Thank be watching. You. I know. Unbridled <laughs> enthusiasm. <laughs> all in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> all right. And next we have um, approval of first read of policy 7552, and it addresses uh, the rights of transgender and gender non-conforming students. Can I have a motion to approve that policy? So moved. Second. Second. And Karen and then Christina. Any questions, comments? I Did also just would like to very quickly comment that many, many years ago now, this district was among the first in the state to have a policy that said you are who you say you are. Mm -hmm. Whomever that may be, we will love you, care for you, and support you, whatever that means. And this policy doesn't change that, it only reinforces it. Interestingly, the changes you are making in this policy are reflective of new state and federal law that provides that same type of protection, long overdue. However, it now institutionalizes, memorializes, and codifies something that is happening now across the state. So it's a moment to be reflective on, one, the work that was done here, and congratulations to all of you and those that came before you, uh, but also good news that that's happening other places now. So this policy really just <coughs> reflects that and changes our approach to the use of pronouns within the policy itself, actually, ironically, uh, a much more appropriate use of language. Not, so. not significant change to our practice. Really none. It's really mo more yep. language. Yep. yep. All right. Did Thank we, you. Did we vote? No. All, no. all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, next we have the consent agenda. It includes a field trip approval for the speech and debate club to Washington, D.C., it includes a gift in the amount of $250 from Mr. Madhavi Devara, Dev, I practiced this and now I'm not going to be able to do it, Devarakanda, and I hope I said that right. You did. You nailed it. Did I? He's a Rotarian and a wonderful man. Yes. And that's to help um, uh, graduating seniors who, who may have some spe special needs, um, some financial special needs. <coughs> and finally, um, there was a fundraising activity, and it already has happened. It was on May 13th to the South Asian Student Society Student Council, and it was at Nantastic Restaurant in Henrietta. And could I have a motion to approve that? So moved. Sue? Second. Second? Second. Second from Esther. Any questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. And our last business of tonight is to call for an adjournment. Can I have a motion? So moved. Karen? S second? Second. Second Esther. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And we're done for tonight. Thank you, folks. This has been a special presentation from the Brighton Central School District Board of Education.